Today we're going to have our evening keynotes, and we're going to begin just in a moment, but I do want to do a few thank yous before we get started. Um, we do have want to uh, thank all of our sponsors again, uh, the Michigan Film and Digital Media Office, SWIC Media Services, Travel Marquette, Double Trouble DJs, Innovate Marquette Smart Zone, Pride Printing, the Marquette Food Co-op, Range Bank, uh, School of Art and Design at Northern Michigan, Beth Milner Jewelry, uh, I would like to give them all a thanks and uh, for having this event, helping us have this event happen. We do have to show, the, we are going to show one more, the video again, so if you saw it at the afternoon one, I apologize, but uh, we will show the Creative Chambers video again, and then we'll get started with Gabino. Probably the biggest impact that we've seen is a change internally into our organization. We now understand the importance of the creative industries uh, in our entrepreneurial and business ecosystem. One of the biggest benefits so far has been for us as the Traverse City Area Chamber to be able to start thinking about there are these gaps that the creative community and creative industries are experiencing. How can we as the Chamber of Commerce work internally to address those gaps. The biggest impact that we found is the identity that the word creative brings to the area. People are now identifying with that and it's allowing us to bridge the gaps in between all these industries that are previously kind of silos and, and all independent. I believe that the Creative Chambers program has been a catalyst for a number of areas, but most specifically changing the mindset that some of the traditional business sector is also considered creative. This project and this funding enables us to go forth with a really systematic approach for getting that feedback and in the future deploying it into ways to make public space better and for everyone in Detroit um, more so than it already is. This program has really brought a, ch a mindset change to Marquette, kind of just an entirely new way of looking at the creative, creative industries and the you know, creative economy that we have. By looking through a new lens, you find all these new connections and these, these dots to connect uh, between people that otherwise, yeah, wouldn't even have talked before. So I'd recommend the Creative Chambers program to um, any community that wants to understand um, what the workforce of tomorrow is going to look like. For rural communities, it can really serve as a catalyst for getting those creative sectors to the next level. I think every community has a little bit of creativity that's just waiting to be unlocked. So I think that this funding is an amazing way to start thinking differently as a community and to tip back the scales towards the individual and the creative expression that we all have to share. Uh, I'd like to say a few words to introduce 
uh, one of our final keynote speakers at the Revolve Conference, uh, Gabino Iglesias. The first thing that you need to know about Gabino is that he is a force of nature. Uh, Gabino is uh, a writer, a reviewer, uh, an editor, a photographer, a weightlifter, a high school teacher, also a college professor, and generally a badass motherfucker. <laughs> <clears throat> His nonfiction uh, has appeared uh, uh, with NPR, with the New York Times, with the Los Angeles Times, with Los Angeles Times Review of Books, and Spank Magazine. He's the author of, I'm just getting started, <clears throat> he's the author of uh, a number of novels, including Zero Saints, uh, which the author Jerry Stahl calls a fierce, nasty, beautiful sucker punch of a novel. Uh, his most recent novel, Coyote Songs, uh, which we'll be talking a little bit about tonight, is what uh, Gabino calls a barrio noir. It's a horror crime novel that explores outrage, suffering, and violence that characterize the immigrant experience in the American Southwest. Uh, David Joy says of Coyote Songs that if you want to know what Gabino Iglesias accomplishes with Coyote Songs that few other novelists seem capable of, it's that he braids a story of tremendous social importance with an unputdownable plot. That's a tremendous task and one rarely accomplished well. So it's gonna come as no surprise to you that Coyote Songs has been nominated for a variety of awards, including the Locus Award, the Wonderland Book Award, and the Horror Writers Association's Bram Stoker Award. So without further ado, welcome with me, Gabino Iglesias. <laughs> I was, I was gonna walk out like this, but then they call me badass motherfuckers, so I'm gonna redo that and then just come out walking like this. <laughs> welcome, welcome, welcome. So glad to have you, Gabino, for making the, uh, the trek all the way up here and surviving uh, the frozen north a little bit. Um, it's not that bad today. No, it's, this, is, this is a good day. <laughs> uh, so it's a creative conference, so I thought it might be appropriate uh, to begin by asking you about the source of your tremendous creative energy. So uh, what motivated you to want to become a writer in the first place? Uh, was it something that was just like this compulsion that you had, uh, where there's no why, you just had to do it? Or was there some experiences that you always wanted to work through, or some message that you always wanted to send? Like, what's, what's the driving force that gets you to do all of the incredible amount of writing that you've done? Um, I'm a first-generation college student, uh, but my dad was a reader. Uh, he didn't go to college, but he loved books. And uh, uh, we didn't have a lot of money to afford books. <laughs> But one of, my, uh, one of my neighbors did, and at some point they put out a, a box with illustrated, uh, an illustrated uh, versions of uh, Jules Verne novels. And uh, I was out playing one day and I saw them and I picked up as many as I could, and then I remember reading those and just losing track of time. And I was like, my God, this is, is this something that people can do for a living? Um, so I, I started typing up stories, and I think I was in uh, eighth grade, when uh, a, a teacher made us write a story, and then they called my parents in and said, he wrote a story about a family who has a deformed child in the basement, and the child breaks out and slaughters the whole neighborhood. Uh, and my dad said, what's wrong with that? That's, <laughs> yeah. I, I'd watch that movie. Um, and then I, was, <laughs> that I realized that words had, had power, and um, I guess eighth grade was that moment. I was like, that's what I want to do uh, for a living. Uh, which doing for a living means uh, making money at it. So I'm still working on that part, but I do get the writing done. Yeah, so let's, let's I, I, I love that first story that you wrote. <laughs> um, I hope that it's, it's found its way into uh, some of the novels or some of the work that you've done. Um, maybe this is an appropriate time to ask about horror. Um, sure. You're, uh, um, especially Coyote Songs, is this like kind of horror crime sort of blend. Uh, and in one of your other interviews that you did, you said that you really wanted to lean more into uh, horror in Coyote Songs than you'd done in some of your previous work. 
Um, for those of you who haven't read the book, Coyote Songs, uh, as I said in my introduction, is about uh, the pain, the anguish, the suffering uh, of the immigrant experience in America. So I guess I'd want to know whether you think that like, horror is a particularly good genre for addressing some of that experience or what draws you to horror as a, as a genre when you're dealing with some of the themes that you're dealing with. I, I love horror and crime. I think both of them only work uh, when there's empathy. Uh, but when, when, when horror, the, the elements of the genre allow us to put stuff in there that's even worse than what crime does, uh, mm -hmm. the, the worst that can happen in crime is sort of like you get killed. And that's <laughs> it. Uh, horror says, okay, let's get creative with how you get killed. Uh, <laughs> so it, it tweaks your, your emotions a little bit more. And uh, I knew for this novel, the, the amount of suffering that I wanted to present <laughs> had to be all over, uh, uh -huh. even after death. So the only yeah. way that I could do that and pull it off and say, here's a book, and tell a publisher to publish it was if I could identify it as something. So um, horror has ever, always accepted um, horror and ghosts and the afterlife. So it was just easier for me to lean a little harder on that side and be like, hey, here's, some, here's a horror novel. Um, yeah. And it worked out. Cool, cool, great. Um, you have this really distinctive uh, authorial voice when you write, and I, I'm not sure I've read uh, anyone else that, that comes to it with quite the way that you do. There's so much emotion, there's a lot of pain, there's a lot of anger in there too. Um, and you also write both in Spanish and in English and in a blend of the two. And so I'd love to hear about the, the source of that voice. I mean, some authors talk about how they're constantly trying to shape and mold their authorial voice. Other authors say, like, oh, it just kind of flows out of me. Um, how does it work for you? You know, are you trying to shape and mold how you come across, or is this like authenticity from the core just pouring out of you spontaneously? For me, it was a strange trip because uh, I, I started, uh, I had to switch everything that I'd done. Uh, I, I started my, my uh, career as a journalist writing in Spanish. My first short stories were in Spanish. The first thing that I ever had published was in Spanish. And then 11 years ago, I moved here, and it was sort of like, wow, there's so much that you can do in publishing here. So in my head, I just had to switch and write purely in English. Uh, I, I wrote my first novel. It was a mess, 100,000 uh, words Ooh. that were a mess. Uh, I sort of found an agent that eventually vanished. Uh, that one never, will never see the light of day. Um, and then Godmouth came out in 2012, and he just, I, I felt like I was exploring what the U.S. had to offer in terms of publishing, but it, I wasn't completely comfortable with having to translate absolutely everything because that's not how language works in my day-to-day -day life. And uh, with Zero Saints, I just said, today, as I'm writing it, there's no one who will publish it because it's not even done. I'm just going to do whatever I want, and then when it's done, I'll deal with the consequences. And uh, I sent it off to uh, J. David Osborne, Broken River Books, and he had lived in El Paso for seven years, understood a little bit of Spanish, uh, and his only question was, uh, "There's you don't you don't use in his words of uh, italics. You don't use italics. Why?" And I said, "Because it's I don't want to put otherness on that language. It's oh, just okay. a single thing." So he's like, "Okay, fine. We'll keep it that way." Um, and then that's, that's how I speak. That's how my six-year-olds speak. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a high school teacher. That's how it's, it's like 90% Hispanics in my school. That's how they speak. It's our reality. Uh, so it was just allowing it to flow. Uh, I had this conversation recently talking about uh, if, if my mom understood that I, I can call uh, my friend Mike you, and then if I meet Obama, he's you, she would slap me in the face. Because in Spanish, we have tu, yeah. usted. Señor, Señor Don, and then it goes on and on and on. So sometimes it's not that I don't know the word or it doesn't come rapidly to me in English. I will just pick a word in Spanish because I think it sounds richer or a sentence just works better. Uh, so it's a matter of freedom, just letting go, uh, not trying to sound like anybody I ever read or trying to write for, a, for a, an audience, which is like, this is the story in my head. I'm just going to let it roll out. All those, um, the, uh, the prayers, for example, in all my books are always in Spanish because I have like my abuelita's voice, like my grandma, like <laughs> doing that thing in my ear. Uh, I'm not going to translate her. That would be an insult. 
So he just comes out in Spanish. Um, hopefully people enjoy it that way. Yeah, no, uh, it's, it's terrific, it's terrific. Uh, so I want to ask a little bit about the influence thing. Um, you've said in some of your other interviews, or at least one of your other interviews, that uh, you're partly inspired by the work of Gloria Enzaldúa, yep. who also writes about life in the borderlands, uh, also writes uh, partly in Spanish and partly in English. Um, so can you talk about uh, either her influence on your work or some of the other people who have influenced you? Or is it this thing where you're constantly trying to, like sometimes it's the way for me as an author, constantly trying to push my influences to the back of my mind so that it can stimulate more of my own creativity? I think with uh, Ansaldua, it was reading her work was sort of realizing that somebody had already put into words what I felt. You can never go back home. Uh, you, you inhabit interstitial spaces. Uh, there, there's no one place for you ever again. Uh, and then her work just helped me realize everything's a border. So there are things that I cannot do because I, don't, I, I can't read the classics in Russian. That's a language thing. Uh, I, I can't fly away to Paris next week. That, that's, a, that's a money thing. I'm not rich. That's another border. Um, I can't walk into a store with my hoodie and not get looked at because I'm a brown dude in a hoodie. That's another border. Uh, so it, it, was, it was more than geography. When reading Ansaldúa, it was sort of, we just live within all these borders and then rarely realize they're there. Um, and sometimes writing can help us not necessarily break them down because they're too hard, they're too ingrained in society, but it gives us a fluidity to like move over or around them or expose them to other people. Uh, I don't try to keep her far away from me because when I'm writing about ghosts and mutilation and <laughs> anger and my own anger, I'm not even thinking about her. She doesn't pop up into my to my head. But if I ever we were talking before about those negative reviews where people say you should keep the Spanglish to a minimum, then her essay on the untamed tongue mm -hmm. comes back. I'm like that you're trying to tame my tongue. Mm -hmm. Not gonna happen. So in those moments, she jumps to the forefront and be like, no, stick to your guns. I'm watching you. Uh, so it's more like when I'm not writing, she comes to mind. So let's talk about the negative reviews and the rejection. I mean, as an author, rejection, as a creative person, rejection, negative reviews is a crucial part of life. How do you handle the fact that often life feels mostly about rejection and people saying, no, you can't, this isn't good enough? How do you bounce back? How do you keep on coming back and say, I'm going to write another one? You wrote 100,000 words, you said, and it didn't end up seeing the light of day. How do you come back and be like, but I'm going to start again. I'm going to write another one that's better. Where does that come from, man? I, it's ingrained. I don't, I don't have a magic. It's, the first one didn't see the light of day. What, write the next one. Try again. If that one hadn't seen the light of day, write the next one. Uh, as far as reviews go, uh, you don't like it. Thank you for buying it, though. <laughs> I, I appreciate your time and money. Uh, Check out the next one. Maybe you like that one. Uh, and if you don't, I'll, I'll write another one. <laughs> Maybe that one. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't really care. Uh, my, uh, my mom doesn't speak English, so she won't read them. That's like the one. <laughs> that's, that's my one reader. That's my mom. <laughs> that's, I, I won't get that one critique that, uh, that matters. Uh, and the rest is just, I don't care. <laughs> I'm going to do my thing write your negative reviews, uh, yeah. and here I am talking to you. So <laughs> Seems like it's working. It's working. <laughs> What's your day-to-day -day writing process like? Do you work on a schedule? Uh, you said when we were talking before that like you hit a thousand words someday and like one day and that was like a good day for you. Is there a certain number of words you try to hit on your writing days or are you like a I write when the spirit moves me kind of person? Um, do you have a certain amount of time that you carve out every day? Like is it ritual for you or is it just like I, I wish it was a ritual. It's sort of a, oh look, there's 35 uninterrupted minutes. Let's try to make it happen. Uh, and I, uh, Wednesday of this week stands out as suddenly I had like one chunk hours uh, during the day that I did not expect to have, um, and, a, and a computer with me. That's just that's that's right. Uh, sometimes that doesn't happen for weeks, um, and after like two weeks, it starts playing on your. How long are you going to take? When's the next one coming? Are you done? <laughs> are, you, are you keeping track of the, all the ideas that you're losing when you're not writing them down? 
uh, so it's it's kind of creepy to think about it that way. But it's 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 three jobs and and life at home and reviewing and writing for NPR and, and criminal element and all the other venues and. Um, I love my own writing as much as I love everybody else's. Mm -hmm. So I never, I never stop doing a review because I have 20 minutes and rather write. Those reviews have deadlines, so they always take priority. I'll turn those in, and then the next 20 minutes that are free, I'll write um, if I can. Um, but teaching, as you know, it's great. I have uh, Thanksgiving to look forward to, so I'll get up very early and go to bed really late during Thanksgiving, and then that week, I'm not going to sit around and wait for inspiration. I want to sit down and write mm -hmm. every minute of it. Let, let's, I want to talk a little bit about some of these other hats that you wear. Uh, you're a writer. We've talked a bunch about that. Um, you're also a reviewer. You're also a, just a, a lover of books. You've got this, uh, I, I haven't heard anybody else say this, but you have this piece where you call yourself, you're not a bookworm. You're, book shark. A, you're a book shark. Sorry. Yeah, and part of being a book shark is that you have this like strong, deep, abiding preference for reading uh, above watching television or movies. And I imagine some of that is just like personality, but I wonder whether there's something more there, whether you think uh, books are capable of accomplishing things that television shows and movies just uh, can't accomplish. Uh, maybe another way to spin this question is to ask, like, uh, would you ever want one of your books made into a television show or a movie, other, like, aside from the money, right? That'd be great. But uh, are there things that, like, no, that, that, that those things couldn't accomplish what you can accomplish in your medium? I, I, every writer, I think they'd be lying if they said no. Uh, but I, I talked to writers who've done this uh, for a long time. Uh, Serious Saints was optioned uh, and has been re-optioned since. Uh, one of the first people I emailed was uh, National Treasure Joe Lansdale, and he said, uh, and I quote, uh, fucking take the money and run. <laughs> and then he said, uh, what I mean is uh, all my books have been optioned. They're not going to get turned into movies, but like once a year I get a check. Uh -huh. So... <laughs> So there's that. Uh, there's that. Uh, but in terms, like, from the philosophical, I mean, I'm a philosopher, I've got to ask these silly right. philosophical questions. Philosophically, you think there are things that fiction can do that uh, movies just can't do, televisions can't do, that, like, the written word has some kind of greater power? I, I've been hanging out with uh, Mike Walker over here uh, since this morning. I don't think we've talked about movies once. And I love movies. Mm -hmm. um, that said, they don't do the same things in my head fiction does. Uh, I've never done goosebumps uh, from a movie. Uh, the jump scares in films, I love horror to death. Uh, but at this point, I've seen so many horror movies. As soon as the music starts, they're queuing it up. I know it's coming. It might surprise me because it's like two seconds too late or just after the music starts. Uh, but I just, I just prefer movies. And Usually, really interesting conversations might end up in movies, but if they do so, it's because they began with us talking about books, uh, or it usually goes the other way around, like, have you seen this movie? Yeah, I've seen that movie. It kind of reminded me of the story, uh, or have you read the novel? And then that turns into conversation about, about books. Um, I, moved, uh, I moved to Austin. I had my guitar, a laptop and a, a backpack full of books. I had no TV, no cable, and uh, 2008 was the last time that I had a TV or, or cable. I, I felt no need uh, so far to go back to that, and once in a while, it's like I, I really have to check out Hereditary. It's like I'll, <laughs> I'll pull out the laptop, and that's a TV now. Or uh, somebody said there's this really stupid thing the president said. I'll go look it up on Twitter and watch it on my phone. It's a small TV in my pocket, so I just... I, I forgot that TVs existed for a while. Um, I feel better for it. I get less depressed now that I watch less TV. Oh, that's that's what I need then. All right. <laughs> I Alcohol helps. Um, only in the short term. Only in the short term, friend. Not if you keep drinking. <laughs> it's not a, derailed. I'm this, sorry. this is a different kind of conversation. I'm gonna hydrate. I'm gonna be healthy what kind of, now. What 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 what's your what's your liquor of taste? Which day? Tequila Tuesdays. Okay. Okay. Are we having tacos? If Mike's making them. Hell yeah. Tequila. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, 
so you're 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 not just a writer. You have uh, you're a reviewer for like lots of lots and lots and lots of different places. Um, and I know that you have really lofty ambitions for your own fiction. Uh, one of the things that I love about Coyote Songs is that it's you know it's not just a, a great tale. It's also a book that has serious ambitions in terms of the message that it's trying to communicate. Um, so I'd love to know like when you're reviewing books. What are the kinds of things that you're looking for? Do you have the same kind of lofty ambitions for all those books? Like, do you think that there's some kind of obligation on the part of fiction to send us some serious message in today's age? Um, how do you feel about books that are just like they're just interested in a fun tale? Or like, what are like what are you looking for? Just more generally, as a reviewer of books, it's funny that we just talked about uh, TV and movies. I think there's a TV show or a TV channel now for everybody. Like literally, uh, if you're into golf, there are channels where you can watch people golf for 24 hours a day. Uh, I was telling Mike this morning, my last 10 trips, it doesn't matter where I've been or what time of the day I get to the hotel, I turn on the TV and there's Guy Fieri. Mm -hmm. um, and that dude's on TV 24 hours a day. Somebody's watching. I don't know who. I'm mesmerized because I don't watch TV regularly, so every time he's in there with his frosted tips. And I know, he's got to figure it out, man. Right. <laughs> um, so there has to be fiction for everybody. Uh, mm -hmm. So if you want to read Twilight, I'm happy that's out there for you. Uh, <laughs> if somebody's making money out of that, God bless them. <laughs> Go make their money. Uh, but uh, I, when I start pitching books, I, I have those expectations. I'm going to get something out of this book. It's going to burrow them in my skin. It's going to make me think. Uh, it's going to show anything that it deals with, those elements under a new light. Uh, it's going to give me an idea that I've never had. It's going to make me contemplate something in a different way. Um, so go read Twilight if that's your thing, or Fifty Shades of Grey. That's great because we need entertainment. Uh, we need escapism. We need to get the world's a hot mess. So anything that gets us out of here for a little while, uh, it's good. It's a, it's a good investment. Uh, but I, I choose not to read those, I kind of have higher expectations. There's, uh, I love thrillers, I, I love crime fiction. Sadly, it's very formulaic nowadays because we know what works. Uh, even if you look at the covers, it's a, it's a big name on top, blocky letters at the bottom and some human silhouette. Um, so you know what you're getting. I'm gonna watch that. You know, right? <laughs> uh, I'm gonna buy that at Costco. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't have an obligation, no. I mean, if, if you just want to read like one short story a day, you want it to be funny, you don't want to think about anything else in your life or the world or the heavy topics or philosophy, oh my God, it's going to give me a headache, then don't. Like, you, you don't have to go be entertained. But uh, for me, I, don't, I wouldn't ever pitch those or consume those books. Cause so so uh, uh, New York Times comes to you and says, Gabino, New Twilight, coming out. You're gonna. It sounds like you're gonna be a little bit conflicted about. It. On the one hand, you want to say like, yeah, that. What is that kind of book trying to do? It's just trying to entertain. So that's the standard by which we should judge it. On the other hand, you're like, no, no, no. What does it for you? Is so something <laughs> that you said the New York Times though. Yeah. Well, I don't know. So I mean, I'm, I'm just. I'm just trying to pimp some of your stuff, man. <laughs> Go to New York Times. Search for Gabino. Read some I'm, of. The I'm gonna ask the New York Times how how much groceries am I'm gonna be able to buy or what you're gonna pay me. Second of all, no editorial line from you. If I grab that book and I decide to trash it, you let me, <laughs> mm, <laughs> which is mm -hmm. something that some venues won't allow you to do. Oh, really? Uh, yeah. So, yeah. T tell me which venues there are. I'm going to send them my book to get <laughs> reviewed. <laughs> send it to the New York Times with a nice little no, note. No, uh, no. We'll see. Yeah, it's going to it's going to be a table <laughs> fixer. <laughs> uh, so let's talk a little bit about uh, Coyote Songs. Um, you have a couple of copies of Coyote Songs. If people uh, afterwards are interested in purchasing those copies, maybe they might be available. Is that right? Uh, literally a couple. That's all I could find as I ran out of the house. Yeah. Um, so Coyote Songs is a, a mosaic novel. Uh, it has these six main characters um, whose stories are somewhat independent but somewhat intertwined. And they're all wrestling with this same kind of general issue. It's how are you going to respond to injustice associated with immigration-related 
problems. Uh, a lot of them respond with violence. Uh, um, and I want to know, like, well, what brought you to this mosaic format where you have all these characters, same theme, slightly different perspectives, slightly different responses. What did you hope to get out of this mosaic format? What drew you to that? Why do you think that that was like a powerful way to go here? Uh, the previous novel also kind of deals with the border a little bit, but it's, it's a standard novel, normal arc. Um, when I started writing peyote songs, I was teaching ESL classes to adult undocumented workers at uh, Progreso Learning at, in Austin at night. The stories that I heard from these individuals, uh, I've always been uh, a huge fan of the idea of eliminating the bad guy. That, oh, somebody's a bad guy because they did a bad thing. Let's deconstruct that individual, and then when we get to the core of it, you realize they did it uh, for a reason. Like some of my favorite noir is good yeah. people thrown into really bad yeah. circumstances, were forced to do bad yeah. things, which makes them not bad. Um, and I just had all these stories in my head from ladies who, it was a total of 12 courses, and ladies who would have to stop and be like, mister, I would really like to keep going, but I had to, to save my money to pay the coyote to bring my son, or next week I'm not gonna be here because I have to go, and they're, you know, pulling out the back seat of a van to rebuild it so I, we can sneak in my daughter from Mexico. Um, and all those stories started working on my psyche to the point that I, after they were gone, I, I would try to like talk to the office. They have a phone number that we can check up on them. They have an email. And uh, at the end of that year, I was like, there's so much going on that I have to tell, but I couldn't touch their narratives. Those were sacred. I wouldn't even like try to fix shit turn them into fiction, I just felt like a lack of respect. Um, and because my head was just so full of many different stories that were brought together by, by the border uh, from people not only from Mexico, but like Costa Rica, um, Cuba, and I had Dominican undocumented people in there, um, I, I, I knew that I couldn't handle the next book with just a single character. Uh, so it started as a sort of an experiment. Let me see if I can tell four, five, six stories and then bring them together somehow. And then I wrote, uh, I wrote the, the La Bruja first. Uh -huh, okay. And then I decided uh, she's going to be the one that's going to bring everything together. But this isn't a very cinematic start. Uh, it's kind of depressing. So I went with um, Pedrito uh, and his dad getting his brains blown out. Which is also depressing, but more explosive, right? So that's yeah. <laughs> More Literally. cinematic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so Oof. we went with that. <laughs> that was a heck of a start, man. Um, this is going to be related, uh, and maybe this is going to be touching on some stuff that you already said. The, the subtitle for Coyote Songs is A Barrio Noir, uh, which, as far as I can tell from all my sleuthing, this is... Sleuthing. Sleuthing. This is, this is something you invented, it. Barrio Noir. It is and, something I invented. And uh, so tell us a little bit about this subgenre, Barrio Noir. Like, what are the norms of this subgenre? And why did you feel like this is something that you had to create in order to get out your, your message, your ideas, your experiences? When I wrote Zero Saints, it was, it was crime, it was horror, it was magical realism, uh, it was a little bit of sci-fi. Uh, there's a chapter in there about a, a fight in a bar that was, that's autobiographical, that's why I got broken teeth. Um, I, I knew that if 10 people read it, and I try to sell it to them as horror, they would probably be angry at the amount of crime fiction that's in there. If I told them it's crime fiction, all the supernatural horror elements, they would be like, what, <laughs> you know, give me the drugs and the guns and the illegal folks, but not, don't give me the other stuff. Um, and then I realized genre is just this thing that we created to sort of impose limits on ourselves. I was like, no, no, if I make up my own thing, I can pull elements from wherever I want and use them and I can, I can dig into my own life and it's like syncretism in my work and I can do the Spanglish thing without having to tell them uh, that it's a bilingual book and I can use horror and I can use magic realism and I can use crime and I can use noir and uh, because it's my own thing, I don't have to explain it to anybody. Uh, so probably two days after finishing the last edit, uh, I went back to the first page and said, that's gonna be a barrio noir because wherever I go, my barrio goes. So, and this is my thing, I'm just gonna put it underneath, send it to the editor. He never questioned it, he came out and said, Zero Saints of Barrio Noir, 
I'm like, it's, it's in print, so it's officially a thing now. Um, it's been working out great. Peyote Sons has it too, and the next one will have it too. Awesome, awesome. So uh, let's talk about the, the purpose uh, behind Coyote Songs, uh, maybe Zero Saints too, but I think mostly of Coyote Songs here. There's this old uh, saying uh, from the Roman poet Horace that literature is to, to please uh, and to instruct. Uh, and one of the things I love about Coyote Songs is it's, it is a rip-roaring good tale, that unputdownable plot, but it also has this really serious message about pain, oppression, and the immigration problem. But I also, I want to talk about that message in a second. I think there's like, I really want to plumb the depths of the kind of messages that you're trying to send. Um, but uh, a lot of artists and authors these days uh, aren't just interested in those two goals, pleasing us, giving us, entertaining us, or instructing us. They want to do something more. They want to be political activists. You know, they want their artwork, their novels to change the world. And I guess, um, like following you on Twitter, listening to some of the other interviews you've done, uh, reading Coyote, uh, Coyote songs uh, made me wonder, like, do you see yourself as falling into that camp? Do you see this book as a form of uh, political activism as well as entertaining and instructing? Uh, do you see your books as trying to actually change the political landscape to change the world? I think the most, one, one of the most important things that uh, contemporary fiction can do is uh, not point at stuff, but sort of really illuminate stuff. Uh, and the, the main goal of like border fiction right now, I think should be to rehumanize the discussion. It's entirely political. We know what the two camps say. We understand the law. Um, hopefully we're smart enough to understand that no one, no person can be illegal. Uh, but then we're kind of forgetting that there's individuals. These are people who love their children. If you have children, imagine leaving everything that you know, everything that you love, everything that you understand, your home, your family, your money, your job, your high school friends, leaving everything behind to go live that American dream up and then finding that you get separated from your family and locked in a concentration camp. Those stories get lost in the politics. So it's a really political move on my part, but what I want to do is rehumanize this thing and tell you these are individuals just like you. They're crying at night. They want to see their families. They probably wish they hadn't done it. Uh, let's just make this about the people again. Um, I'm also not a big believer in um, uh, happy endings. because For sure. I'm all for entertainment, but I haven't experienced a lot of happy endings. So uh, they kind of stay away from my fiction just naturally. And um, activist? I don't know. I wrote a book. Um, with my voice was, was bilingual, and I put it out there. As soon as you put, you know, you put your book out there, it's not yours anymore. Uh, until I tell you, uh, you shouldn't have written about this because it's such and such. And so the moment that somebody tells me I should have taken out the, the Spanish because this is the US of A, that's when you kind of push me to become <laughs> a, a militant, radical uh, person and uh, either ignore you because I don't have a lot of time, um, or politely tell you to fuck off, because it's my fiction. Buy it or don't, I don't care, I don't need your money. Mm -hmm. um, I just need you to understand what I'm trying to say. If you can't, there are other books out there for you. Uh, mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. that, it's that reaction that kind of pushes you to sort of act like, a, like an activist. Uh, the rest of the time I'm like, hey, do you want to read a, there, there's a lady who's turning into a cocoon because she has a monster inside. It's a really awesome horror book. Oh, but it's so political. Cool, everything's political, but I'm telling you about the lady. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I want to entertain you too. Uh, if you want to talk about being an activist, then it's usually in reaction to something you've done. So it's like the uh, aftermath of the book, dealing yeah. with other people's <laughs> responses uh, and discussing the book that, like, that makes it a political activist kind yeah. of thing. Yeah. Forces you to sort of adopt that discourse. One of the things, this gets back to some part of your response now, one of the things I love about this book is kind of the honesty about the emotions, um, the honesty about the, the pain that um, people who are suffering from injustice and oppression are experiencing, honesty about their anger. Um, anger is like a driving force of uh, a couple of the main characters of Alma, 
definitely her driving force. Um, uh, and given this, um, it, it, it seems like um, the book is partly for, partly to give voice to these people suffering and oppression, partly uh, um, to uh, give a voice for the, the suffering of the oppressed uh, and the marginalized. Is that, is that right? Do you see the primary audience of the book as being for uh, people who are oppressed and marginalized and suffering from in, injustice? And if so, like, what kind of message do you want to be sending to those readers of your book? At the beginning, I think I did. Uh, and then eventually, very sadly, I realized if that was my audience, I was never going to get to it. The people in the in the camps are not reading, uh -huh. uh, and most of the folks coming in, most of the folks who were my students, uh, they can't read English. Just like my mom and dad can't read my books. So then it became a thing of like, am I really so passionate about what I have to say that I'm going to put it out there, knowing there might not be an audience for it? And at that point, it just became like, yeah, <laughs> I'm so passionate about what I have to say that I'm just going to put it out there and let it try to find an audience. Uh, I'm gonna just try to push it on everybody and hopefully it'll connect uh, with the right people because eventually at the core of it, readers are, are my, my main uh, audience. I don't, I don't care where you're from or how, this is pretty far from the border right here. Yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah. So uh, if you read it here and it connects with some feeling in, inside you, um, great. That's, there, there's a lot about, um, this is probably the first book that I finished after becoming a father. So there's a lot about- Congratulations. Father, mother, thank you. Uh, it, there, there was a lot about uh, being a parent and that, that constant nightmare of the inability to provide or to, to like protect my son. Uh, so I was, I was writing that book and Zero Saints had just came out and I was unemployed and I had received my first ever eviction letter and all of that fear. I was like, this is, this is across the world in every single language. There are people feeling exactly this. Oh shit, I can't protect my offspring. <laughs> so I put that into the book. Hopefully that finds an audience because there's a lot of people being born every day. Uh, mm -hmm. So I don't care what part of the world you're in, you'll, you'll read that and hopefully connect to it. I got another audience question too. I'm very curious sure. about who you're writing for and how you're trying to reach them. Um, as we said before, the book is partly in Spanish, partly yep. in English, and partly in a mixture of the two. Um, and when I when I encountered the first Spanish passage, I mean on the on the first or second page, it must have been. I was wondering, oh, is this book only for people who can read Spanish? Um, and I kind of thought that throughout my reading of the book. But then I read this interview where he said, no, you 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 put the Spanish in there in part to frustrate people who couldn't read Spanish so that they will have the experience that people who can't speak English have when they're trying to work, live, be educated uh, in English-speaking America. So it seems like the book is actually partly for the dominant white English-speaking class. And I guess what else, like I kind of tried to hint at maybe one of the messages that you're trying to send to that like a dominant white uh, American class. Uh, is there other messages that you're sending? So I said, like, the first question was about, like, oh, is it the book partly for people who are oppressed? But it seems like maybe the book is partly for the oppressors, too. Um, and is there a message that you're trying to send, like, white America in and through this book? Literature is funny because uh, we can sit here and talk about the oppressor and then at the end say, like, please go on Amazon and buy it. Uh, <laughs> So uh, anybody who pulls out their new iPhone and double clicks on Amazon and gets the book in like 48 hours uh, will probably be that person you're talking about. I don't want to anger them, but there's something about making them feel uncomfortable. Yeah. You're reading this book, I code switch, now you're the other. You yeah. don't get it, yeah. you don't understand. Maybe you feel a little dumb because you're trying to decode the message. Now. Think next time you're at a hotel and there's a lady trying to clean your room, she doesn't know a word of English. Just imagine her fear. Am I gonna lose my job because I don't if this person complains, like I need to be like extremely subservient. Like what what do I do? And you see it in their face, and I taught them for a year. Um, I remember my, my second class, a lady said, uh, you know what brought me here, mister? I just wanna be able to explain where the ice machine is. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that, I laughed, and then on my, on the ride home, I was like, on the border of tears, like, 
that woman's biggest uh, problem in life is not being able to explain where the goddamn ice machine is. <laughs> um, so I wrote that book for her and also for the guy who probably gets frustrated at her for not being able to tell her where the ice machine is. First of all, don't be an idiot. It's a hotel. Walk down the hallway. You'll find it. Uh, second of all, there are times where you are the other. And if I can, if I can give you a taste of that, maybe that somehow changes you a little bit or makes you think about your next interaction with, with some other in a different way. I, I got lots of questions about how much that change can occur and the degree to which we can really understand, uh, what, to which, the degree to which I could understand um, what it's like to be other in a way that uh, the hotel worker can. I'm going to ask it in like a super duper unnecessary philosophical way though. <laughs> that's what you do. Yeah, that's, that's, that's how I roll. Right? <laughs> uh, so there's this movement in philosophy called standpoint epistemology. Um, it's complicated, but the basic idea is that uh, what you, yeah, right? <laughs> uh, what you know depends on where you stand in the power hierarchy. So people who are at the bottom of the power hierarchy in society can know and have access to different kinds of knowledge than the people at the top of the power hierarchy. And then some people, people add that, like, oh, the, the, the people at different places on the power hierarchy can't understand each other. And in particular, there's a lot of emphasis on how uh, the people at the top of the power hierarchy cannot understand the experiences of the people at the bottom of the hierarchy. So if I, as a, as a white guy in an upper middle class uh, world with a well-paying job, can't understand the experience of what it's like to be othered in the way that that maid in the hotel room can. One question I have is, is whether art has the ability to overcome those divides. Can a novel such as yours convey to someone who's at the top of the power hierarchy something of the experience of what it's like to be at the bottom? Can art bridge this divide that we have in our society between people who have power and people who don't? Short answer to that is, I can choose shit, try. Um, the long answer, uh, the more academic answer, would be... Thank you. I remember uh, reading Spivak, uh, the subaltern cannot speak. And I remember thinking, no, <laughs> you're wrong. We can. It's just that they won't listen. Uh, and since then, I've, I, I've become obsessed with the psychogeography of, of crime fiction. Like, it's impossible for me to explain to somebody who was born into a house where both parents made 150K a year what it's like to ponder crime only because you need to pay rent. Mm -hmm. um, and that goes back to the deconstruction of the bad guy who's not really bad, he's just desperate. Um, I can try. Some people will, some people won't. Um, my only problem is with what you're presenting is thinking that those at the top are like this homogeneous-minded individuals. Thankfully, they're not, uh, or not overwhelmingly. Um, the majority, maybe, yes, uh, but they're also probably not reading these type of books. Uh, there's no appeal to them to explore further what's going on at the, at the border. Uh, but a book can try. If you're willing to connect with it, you, you might feel that little bit of otherness, you won't understand what she feels like because you, you have nothing running in this game. You're not gonna lose your job. Uh, you have the freedom just skipping that paragraph. It doesn't mean your livelihood will be put in danger. Uh, but maybe you want to understand, maybe you want to put yourself in, in, in those shoes for a little bit. So I'll try whether that happens or not or to what degree that happens or not. Uh, it's, it's up to the individual who's reading the book. I can't tell you if it's happening with folks who actually have money, because I don't know any. Uh, <laughs> but folks who are not struggling to pay the rent uh, have indeed said, sort of, I, I felt excluded, and I didn't like it. Uh, and then I realized that maybe you were doing that on purpose. And then you know my Kindle translated for me, so I felt a little better. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> so maybe on some tiny little level, uh, I'm able to do that, um, hopefully. I think so, man. I think that's one of the reasons that the book has been uh, such a powerful success. Keith, are you giving me the... Uh... Okay. Um, I've, got, I've got one question left, but it's like a super long one. <laughs> um, do it fast. 
Okay, fast. Coyote Songs is not an easy novel. This is a hard novel. It's a difficult novel to read, partly because of how much it deals with violence. And when I talk to my students about uh, violence in art, uh, I say, look, we got to remember there's a difference between uh, depicting violence and endorsing violence. Uh, a, a book can describe violence. It doesn't mean it's celebrating it or endorsing it or putting it forward. So we got to keep that straight in our minds. We also got to keep straight in our minds the difference between the point of view of the book and the point of view of the author. Right? A, a particular book might have an attitude towards violence. The author's like, well, that's not my view. I was just trying that on. Or it's just fiction, people, you know. So I'd love to hear you talk about, um, is there a point of view that Coyote Songs has about violence, in particular violence in response to injustice, violence in response to uh, oppression? Um, and it might be that there's no unified point of view because it's a mosaic novel. Um, but I guess I'd like to hear you talk a little bit about what Coyote Songs is saying, uh, even if it's multiple things, about violence in the face of oppression. It's not a long question. It's an impossible one. Uh, here's why. Do I advocate uh, violence regularly? No. I've been working on my own anger for years. <laughs> uh, this administration has made me work on my anger on a daily goddamn basis. Uh, on that note, have you punched a Nazi recently? Feels good. Uh, <laughs> so it's sort of this... Uh, again, there's... No <laughs> All right, that's all I'm saying. My Let's go back to the academic. My parents, German immigrants. <laughs> <laughs> so it's the reason why they left. Um, there's, there's, there's no need for violence until there is. Uh, so there, there's a point in which, you know, as, as a philosopher, everything is a, is, is a power struggle. Uh, sometimes that power struggle becomes physical. That, that's the history of the world. Uh, so, I, I talked to my students in my ethnic studies class. Uh, can you name a, a modern colony? And they start thinking, like, no, we, we, colonial times are already passed. And then after like five minutes, I'm like, I'm, I'm sorry to bother you, but I, I, I was born and raised in a colony, and my people can't vote for the president because we're second class citizens. So, I, I don't feel a need to be violent about it on a daily basis because it's a political situation. That said, if I'm on the bus in Austin and I see somebody pushing or shoving a woman because she has something that they don't approve of on their head, or I see you picking on a, on a, on a Mexican dude because he just uh, looks like a typical construction worker in Austin with the dirty concrete boots riding the, the, the bus with me, and, and there's like a physical aspect to it, fuck yeah, violence. You, you brought it on yourself. Let's do this. <laughs> uh, and uh, the, the end result of that, boys and girls, is that when you go to interviews, they call you badass motherfucker. So I'm all for it. <laughs> we have time for one or two questions from the audience, if anyone has any questions. I was wondering if you have anything that um, you would really wish to see this book get used for. Like, I worked for an African community center for a very brief period of time, and the guy that hired me, and it was like, am I qualified? Can I do the job? And also, you need to go read what is the what so that you understand what, where these people are coming from. And so I was just wondering if you have any kind of similar wish list. Would you love to see this book used for blank to educate people on what these experiences are like? There's a beautiful experience uh, every time my MFA students ask me where I got my MFA, and I say nowhere because I don't have one. Uh, and, and it's only matched by the feeling I get whenever I get an email saying, I, I teach this class on otherness, and I assign this to my MFA class. I love that. If, if more writers can see, I, I didn't get to read a book in Spanglish until later in life. Uh, if I had had that chance to read it early on, I wouldn't have struggled at the beginning with like that freedom of letting go. Um, so if we can take MFA students and give them all the bilingual literature that's out there right now, 
Um, and by bilingual, I mean any other language uh, besides Spanish. Um, if they could do that with my book, awesome. That would be a dream. One more question. Uh, Event Horizon. <laughs> I don't know if y'all seen it. It's an old one, um, but I, I saw it on way too early, way too early in my life. Um, and then it had uh, those. Uh, I don't know how many of you have seen it. I'm not giving away anything too important. Uh, they hear in the in the video, uh, "Liberateme," and then at the end of that, they go like. Shit, sorry, it was a, we misheard. It said, liberate to teme. So it's not like, save me, save yourself. And I was like, oh my God, that's brilliant. That's, that's half a life, you misunderstanding people and then doing the wrong thing. Uh, and then that became my favorite horror movie. <laughs> Do we have any other questions from the audience? I'm sorry about eye contact. I just can't see any of you. It's just darkness out there. Uh, I'm reading a, a book of essays by um, African-American author Steve uh, Perry called Some of Us Are Hungry Now. It comes out um, on the 12th from $2 Radio. It's amazing. And uh, I'm reading, I, I'm blanking on his name. Uh, it's a nonfiction book that also comes out on the 12th. It's called Simply Secondhand. And it explores... Uh, the, the world economy of like secondhand things and how the U.S. is like the number one place in the world for hoarding and then we die and then what happens to those things, what happens to electronics and clothing and toys and uh, knickknacks and all the stuff that gets destroyed uh, on a global economy level and that it's pretty amazing uh, airport reading. <laughs> Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you.